Sorry about that. Apologize, everybody. Sorry about that. Sorry, I, had to, I didn't have a chance to eat today. So I'm sure you, you know, Sundays are crazy days around here, especially for me. So I didn't have a chance to get anything to eat. So I'm sorry if we've been a little bit less organized than usual, not really on the A game today. Um, Brother Matt, is there any barbecue sauce in the back? Check the fridge. Yeah, hurry up. Hustle up, buddy. Anyway, I mean, I'm sure you guys can appreciate the fact that, I mean, Sundays, I mean, writing a sermon, two sermons, soul winning, really wears on a guy, you know? You find some? Thank you. Especially like during the week. I mean, you guys, especially the men. You guys do like men's preaching nights? It takes forever to write a sermon, right? I mean, I'm working a full-time job here. Can you imagine? Three sermons a week. Soul winning tip. It's nuts. Just think silently to yourself for a couple minutes. We'll get to going here in a second. You grab me a napkin. Need that many. Okay, where are we at here? Second, Second Samuel chapter twenty. Let's go ahead and see what the Bible has for us this evening. Oh, brother Matt, you grab my Bible. Sorry. Just, uh, just meditate for a little bit. Second Samuel chapter 20, my Bible ever gets here. <clears throat> there you go. Thank you, Brother Matt. All right, so we're continuing the Good Habits series this evening, and tonight we're going to talk about the subject of being late. We're going to talk about the subject of being on time to things and tarrying long. Or, you know, I guess we could look at the positive uh, spin of being late and talk about being on time. Okay, so we're going to look at this story in 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel chapter 20 and see what the Bible has to say. We're talking about good habits, continuing this series. We're going to talk about this idea of being timely or, you know, tarrying, tarrying longer than you should, as the Bible would call it. Okay, so let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 20 and see what the Bible says, and then we'll do some application as we usually do. Okay, the Bible here says in 2 Samuel chapter 20, we have an interesting story. David has just um, put down the rebellion of his son, and he has taken his son's general, Amasa, and made him his general. And then we have another uprising happening to David here. And the Bible is talking about this in 2 Samuel chapter 20. Look down at verse number 4 we see that King David gives Amasa a command. This man, um, Sheba, the son of Bichri, is, or Bichri, or however you want to pronounce it. Um, if, I, if I was on time to the sermon, I would know how Brother Ryan pronounced it. I try to match his pronunciation so it's, it's, uh, it's consistent. But basically we see that David sends his new general um, on a task here. And let's take a look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, Then said the king to Amasa, King David, Assemble the men of Judah within three days, and be thou here present. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he tarried longer than the set time which he had appointed him. And David said to Abishai, Now shall Sheba, the son of Bichri, do us more harm than did Absalom. Take thou thy Lord's servants, and pursue after him, lest he get him fence cities, and escape us. And verse number 7, And there went out after him Joab's men, and the Cherethites, and the per Pelethites, and all the mighty men. And they went out of Jerusalem to pursue after Sheba, 
the son of Bichri. So let's look at this story here, and I want to just point out a couple things about David sending Amasa on this task. The first point is that David was relying on Amasa here. There was a very serious situation going on in Israel, in Judah, and David, or in Jerusalem, I'm sorry, and David was, you know, relying on this new general of his. So by being late, the first thing is, he was relying on Amasa, and by being late, Amasa let him down. He let David down. You know, why, you know, why was he late, you say? You know, why was he late? You know, I went to get some McDonald's, so I was late. Okay? That's disgusting, by the way. I don't know how anybody ever eats that stuff. <laughs> Talk about sacrificing yourself for the ministry. Okay? But look, especially after the New Year's Eve sermon. But the point is, David was relying on Amasa here. Amasa clearly let him down. And the Bible doesn't say why Amasa was late. It doesn't tell us. You know, maybe, I mean, you could, I could think of all different kinds of things. Maybe it took him longer than expected to do this complex task that David asked him to do. I mean, that's a, it wasn't a simple thing, go gather all these people for war. I mean, that's not a simple task. Or maybe, you know, Amasa thought that he needed more men than he could get in three days. Maybe he wanted to get a thousand men and maybe, you know, he could only get a hundred. I mean, who knows? I'm just throwing some things out there. But look, the bottom line is it took longer, but in such a case, he should have come back at the set time with whatever he had is what he should have done and respected the set time that he had. And all David knew was he wasn't there when he needed him to be there. That's all David knew. I mean, David literally had to send somebody else here. David had to find somebody else and send somebody else. So look, this is a lesson for you guys. All, I mean, look, the boss is not going to care why you missed the deadline. They don't care why. They just know that you missed the deadline. They know that it didn't get done. Because you see, you know, just because there was a, re I mean, there was a reason from David's perspective, there was a reason for the three-day timeline. There was a reason. David was a man of war. He wasn't an idiot when it came to war. I mean, David was a war fighter his whole life. And in this case, look at 2 Samuel chapter 20, look at verse number 6. In this case, it was a strategic reason. Look at verse 6. And David said to Abishai, now shall Sheba, the son of Bichri, do us more harm than did Absalom. Take thou thy Lord's servants and pursue after him, lest he get him fenced cities and escape us. Look, it was strategic. David knew what he was doing. He, he wanted to stop Sheba from gaining more influence. He wanted to stop Sheba from gaining more defensible positions. He wanted to, stop, he wanted to put down this rebellion quickly before it took root. Okay, so like, look, lives, I mean, this particular deadline, lives depended on this deadline. People were going to die if this deadline was not kept. And it wasn't kept. Amasa should have came back with whatever situation he was able to gather by this set time. Period. So look, and, and here's why I know that his excuse, what, whatever his reason was, here's why I know that it wasn't good enough because he was not dead. And that would have been the only excuse that would have been okay in this situation if Amasa was actually dead. If he actually died trying to gather the men to come fight. So the second point is this. <clears throat> the second point from this story is this. The job still needed to be done. The second point is that David needed to then rely on somebody else. David needed to rely on somebody else. Now, Joab goes after Sheba. Now look, we're going to talk about Joab in, in, some, in, in, in the coming weeks. We're going to talk about Joab in detail. Joab had a lot of problems. Okay, and one, but one thing about Joab is Joab was a driver. Look, you did not want Joab after you. And that is one thing that is clear from the Bible. You do not want Joab and the mighty men coming after you. Joab knew how to get things done. One way or the other, Joab got things done. We'll talk about Joab in a lot of detail. I don't want to give all that away. But look, Joab knew how to get things done, and he despised those that didn't. That's one thing about Joab. We'll discuss him in the coming weeks. It's not the scope of this sermon this evening, but the job still needed to be done, is the point. So the fact that Amasa failed the deadline, David needed to rely on somebody else. That job still had to be done. So 
Let's talk about good habits this evening. Let's talk about, you know, being timely in your life and how important that is. What we can take from this, you know, this story, and, you know, let me just give you some thoughts on, on being late in, in your life. Let's look at some characteristics first of people that are late, people that are constantly having a hard time, you know, being on time. I'm going to give you some characteristics first of all. Now, first of all, could David rely on Amasa? Absolutely not. He could not rely on Amasa. And obviously, Amasa, you know, was killed, you know, but, you know, if, if Amasa would have lived through the situation, David would have now known that he could not rely on Amasa. So, people that are late can't be relied upon. That's the first thing. That's the first characteristic. You know, David was trying to make peace with Amasa. He was trying to make peace with the whole situation with, I mean, David had a heart for this. David was a peacemaker. I mean, imagine Amasa was the general that led a rebellion against him, and he makes him his general. David was trying to be a peacemaker. He was trying to give the guy a chance, you know, and he just proved right away, like, the first thing that he just couldn't be relied upon. And if you cannot be on time, you will never be someone that is given more responsibility. If Amasa wouldn't have been killed, I can guarantee that David would not have relied on him in the same way ever again. I mean, look, that's the best case scenario. The best case. I mean, look, at work, at work, it will probably be worse. I mean, you'll probably get fired. You'll probably get fired at work. If you just can't show up on time to work, you're probably going to get, I mean, back home, I mean, let me just, back home, for sure, you're getting fired. If you can't, like, when I grew up and where I grew up, if you can't show up on time, you're fired. I mean, it's like simple. Here, it's a little different, I think. But back home, where I grew up, you were fired if you couldn't show up on time. Here today, it, it, I mean, the job that I had before I came to Fresno, I was, I was building a, a hydroelectric power plant. And I was the designer, and I worked with this electrical superintendent who, with his crew, was installing my design. So I worked with this superintendent on site every day for three years. And I used to just chide the guy. I would kind of, you know, you know, in a nice way, kind of give him a hard time sometimes because it seemed like every single week he had a different crew. I mean, it was a little irritating for me because I want to have things done right. And, you know, I'd be like, you know, hey, Phil, you got a new crew this week again? You know, I'd just give him a hard time. And the guy was so frustrated. He's about 65 years old. He was an older electrician. I mean, the guy knew his trade, he knew what he was doing, and he was, I mean, he was so frustrated with the situation, he told me one time, he said, hey, if you show up on time every day, you're like a superhero. I'm going to give you a cape. And he was right. So that's the, that's the great, that's the good news, young men. If you show up on time every day, you're going to get a cape in, in, the, in the world that we live in. And this is true, because by the end of that job, by the end of that three years, the guy that was running that crew was 24 years old, but he showed up on time every single day. 24 years old, and he's a foreman over 50-year-olds, 60-year-olds, because he shows up on time every day. I mean, it, I mean, this is how valuable this is. Look, people in authority, you have to understand the perspective. If you're constantly late, it's a perspective problem. You have to understand the, the perspective of people in authority. Look, they have a perspective where they need things done. They have a plan. I mean, someone in authority has a plan. David had a plan. He had a plan that he wanted this thing done in a certain way. And look, these people in authority are not just flopping through life. Or they wouldn't be in authority. They have a plan. And look, you may not have that perspective. But if you ever want to be an authority, you better get that perspective. And it'll help you to be on time and be that responsible person. Look, if you ever want to be replied upon, relied on, you know, you need to be on time. If you're late all the time, you will never be someone that can be trusted with things. That's the first point. The second point, brother, is, is the coffee ready? Is that the beep I heard? The, the, was the beeping the coffee maker? Just meditate to yourself for a second.
Which one is this one here? Sorry, I was up early this morning. Okay, what were we talking about? Brother, where were we at? Oh yeah, second point. People that are late all the time are putting their agenda ahead of yours. People that are constantly late are putting their agenda up above the agenda of others. Translation, they're selfish. They're thinking that their time is more valuable. You say, well, Amasa just wanted to get more people. He just wanted to be safer. He should have put, well, that's Amasa's agenda then. Let's say for just example that Amasa wanted 500 people for the battle. And that's why he was late. He was going to take an extra day and get those 500 people because he thought he was a pretty good general and he knows to fight somebody like Sheba, he needed 500 guys. And he's just going to get those 500 guys. That's his agenda. That was not David's agenda. David's agenda was be back here in three days. That was Amasa's agenda. So he, whatever you can say about the excuse, it was Amasa's agenda over David's. He should have put David's agenda over his. I mean, if he showed up with 100 guys, or 500 guys, David then could have made the decision, hey, that's not enough, we're going to get some more, I'm going to supplement you with the mighty men, or two mighty men, would probably have been enough, if you know the story of the mighty men, but he could have had, he's still been underneath David's agenda. But instead, by putting his agenda over David's, he kept David, the one making the decisions, in the dark. It's not good. So in short, people that are late, they're selfish. Look, leaders need people that they know that when they give an order, come hell or high water, that will be done. That's what people need. That's what leaders need. These are the, I mean, and those are the people, by the way, that are highly valued by leadership. Gold. Just pure gold, those people. So what Amasa was really saying was, you know, your agenda is not as important as mine. And whatever that agenda was, the reason doesn't even matter. The reason doesn't even matter. And please don't miss this. When you are late, you are sending a message loud and clear that whatever you have going on is more important than everybody else. That your time is more valuable, that whatever that thing that you have is more valuable. Look. That, that going to get, you know, McDonald's chicken nuggets is more valuable than your time sitting here is, is what you're saying. I mean, and think about this. In this story in 2 Samuel chapter 20, we're talking about, we're talking about completing complex tasks. We're talking about going to, I mean, could you, hey, uh, Brother Matt, could you go get me an army, please? You know, Brother Matt brought me some barbecue sauce. I mean, we're talking about go and assemble an army, please. That's a complex thing to do. Go get me an army, but you know, showing up on time, I mean, that's a simple task. That's a very simple task. If you can't do that, you have zero hope of becoming this type of person. I hate to break it to you. But, I mean, I think that, you know, as I study this through the Bible, by the way, this is such a simple no-brainer that you should show up when you're supposed to show up that's why you don't even have a specific proverb on it, on showing up on time. You can't, I mean, you can't really find it. I mean, I, I had to kind of reach for stories on finding, you know, a Bible story on someone being late, and, you know, but there's no specific proverb on it, which brings me to my third point that is this. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. My third point is this. People that are late do not keep their word. Whoa! That's harsh, you say. Well, let's look at what the Bible says. Let's look at what the Bible says. And I'll explain to you why there's not a simple proverb on showing up somewhere on time. I'll show you. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Look at verse 36. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 12, in verse number 36, the Bible says, But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Every idle word will be judged. What's an idle word, you say? Well, I mean, what's an idle car? 
An idle car is a car that goes nowhere. It just sits there. So idle words are words that go nowhere. They mean nothing. They're just words that you say. I mean, it's a word that goes nowhere. Look, if you have a job, let me explain this to you. If you have a job, if you're employed, if you're employed, by accepting that job, you agreed to show up on time. It's a contract. It's a contract by having that job. If you do this, we will pay you this. And your contract is, is to show up at a certain time for a certain period of time. I mean, this isn't that hard. Being late actually makes you a liar. Now we've got some Bible. <laughs> now, now, I mean, since being late makes you a liar, we, we, could, we could just go off on the Bible for hours on that. That's why it's not in the Bible on just being on time, because being late is the breach of a contract, in your job anyway. So now that we put things in the light of the Bible, we see that people that are always late, they're unreliable, selfish liars. That sounds bad. You say, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. I don't want people to think that of me. How can I be on time? Well, here's, here's some more help for you. Another reason people that are not late are so irritated with those that are is because it's an incredibly easy problem to fix. It's an incredibly easy problem. And it, look, it's proof. It's proof. People that, it's proof that people can fix the problem in their life. People that are not late are examples that the problem can be fixed. It's fixable. And they realize, these people realize that the solution is extremely simple. So you say, you know, maybe people should, you know, you're sitting there and you're thinking, because look, there's a lot of people that struggle with this in this church. I'm just going to come out and say it. And you say, you know, maybe people should just be more patient with others. Right? But here's the thing. Hang on. I just got a text here. <laughs> That's from Garrett. He's texting me during church. That's... Please send me the pictures of our trip the other day. Okay. Well, I've, I've got some pictures. Just real quick. Just... Here's the thing, if I was expecting all of you to wait on me constantly, look, it was killing me to do all these little things that I was doing. It was murdering my soul. I don't know how to tell you. I was telling my wife after Brother Ryan was going to, I was standing outside with the McDonald's bag and I, I told my wife I'm going to wait two minutes. I couldn't do it. I was dying inside. I was dying. If it would have got to two minutes, I would have been dead on the sidewalk. My heart was stopped. But here's the thing. You all think, oh, you know, we're all late all the time everywhere we go. But, you know, here's the thing, folks. I mean, if I was like that, you all would be so irritated with me. I mean, it's funny. It's funny because you know it's a joke. But if I was just a mess, and I'm like, oh, paper's fine. Wrote, wow, Second Samuel, what? I don't know. Sermon's not done, man. You all be so irritated with me. And I mean, you know, look, if I wasn't organized to have things ready in time, I mean, I expected you all to just wait on me. I'm getting text messages during church, which I would never get from my son because he's not allowed to have his, his phone in the church. And if all of you teenagers were my children, you would not have your phones here either. That's another sermon for another time. But where were we? Being late. If I all expected... You to just wait on me. My, my phone is thinking it's solving problems for me. Here's some results. How to preach. Anyway, <laughs> if I just expected you all to just wait on me, I never had things in order, you know, look, or, or just like, hey, stop while I get some coffee during sermons. Look, it's, you all, it would not be funny. I mean, this was some theatrics tonight, but if I operated this, you would be so irritated with me because I'm telling you that I could care less about your time, is what I'm telling you. Uh, excuse me, please meditate to yourself while I get a cup of coffee. I mean, it's funny, but it's, it, it wouldn't work. And look, 
Here's the thing. If I was like that, you would not trust me. If you didn't know if I was going to be up here for announcements or not, if I was going to be up here on time for the sermon or not, if I was going to show up to church someday, maybe some days I didn't even show up. I mean, look, you would not trust me. A seemingly small thing, now let's get serious for a second, a seemingly small thing would lead to big problems, and if it was up here, it would lead to the failure of this ministry. So it's funny and it's small and all this, but I'm really trying to get a serious point across here. I mean, it would lead to failure of this entire thing. A small, tiny, little, silly thing. So look, it's actually a problem for some people. I mean, look, when the, when the ladies of the church prepare an event, uh, a party, and they put in work, and they go and they decorate, and they do all these things, and then, and then people, people can't show up on time? I mean, look, you are saying you could care less. I mean, look, this, is actually, this has actually happened. You have a party that serves food, and people are late to the party because they stopped to get food. I I'm not kidding. I mean, when I hear stuff like that, look, when I hear stuff like that, things in my mind, they cross, wires cross, and smoke comes out my ears. This is why, this is why pastors have to be married. Because I, smoke comes off my ears, and I go and I load up the nuclear weapons, and I put the missiles in the car, and I'm just like, ah, and my wife talks me off the cliff. She's like, no, the party was great. Everybody had fun. The party was wonderful. The, every, the ladies are wonderful, all this, and I'm just like, ah, ah. okay. That's why pastors have to be married. That's one of the reasons, for sure, for sure. But look, you are, I mean, seriously, I mean, look, we love you all, but you are sending a clear message that we could care less what you've done here. We could care less about your time. We could care less about your effort. We could care less about your labor. We could care less about your agenda, is what you're saying. Here's another one, soul winning tips. Soul winning tips are five minutes long. Soul winning tips are five minutes long. I write three sermons a week, and I also write one soul winning tip. But you know what? I put some time into that soul winning tip. I think about it. I, look, one of the main cultures of this church is soul winning. Amen. And I think about, what do we need to be better soul winners? What do we need? What do we, what's the medicine that we need? And we learn together. One of the most irritating things for me in the world is when people come, you know, and look, I love visitors from other places, or when people pop in or, you know, come to church once every two months or whatever, and like, they're just not on our program. And I'm like, you know, we're all in the same program here. We're all in the same culture here. We have this culture of thorough, awesome soul winners here. And so, look, the soul winning tip is part of that culture. So I write a soul winning tip, it's five minutes long, and you bust in, you know, halfway through the soul winning tip, and everybody's like, what, what, was, what was that? You know, and all this, and it just wrecks the whole soul winning tip. But what you're, what you're saying is, you know, you don't care about, you know, you, you don't care about my time, is what you're saying. It shows that you can care less about the agenda of the church. You say, but I don't feel that way. You say, but I don't mean it like that. I don't feel that way. Well, you know what those are? Those are idle words. Those are idle words. Because your actions matter more than your words. What you do matters. I mean, talk is cheap. So look, church life is so simple. It really is. You want to be successful in church, you find out what the pastor's agenda is, and you get on it. That's it. You don't like the agenda? Don't come to this church. Now, I'm not saying that in the way of like, no, don't come to this church. But I'm saying like these people that come, like people come here and visit and they complain about their church. They come here and they're like, ah, my church, this and this and this and this and this. Why are you going to that church? If you can't get, along, get on the agenda of the church, I mean, you shouldn't be at the church. So, I mean, that's the thing. So that, that's why people that come here and complain about their church, I mean, I don't really want to hear it. They may all be true. Who knows? But I don't care because it's like, you know, if you're sitting in a church and you're not on that agenda, you're a coward. I mean, that's what you are. But look, nothing shows that you could care less about the agenda of a church than just being late all the time. And look, I, look personally, I'm just the wrong person for, <laughs> for, 
for doing it. This is the wrong church to be late to. Because look, it, it, it's, the, the fix is super simple, folks. There's, I'm going to give you three tips now on being on time. The first one is this. The first tip to be on time, write this down. It's a four-letter word. Lead. Lead. That's it. You say, how long does it take me and my family to get ready every single morning? And you know, you say, it's one hour and we're always 15 minutes late. Well, get a calculator and set your alarm clock 30 minutes earlier. You say, 30 minutes? Well, that's tip number two. I'll get there in a second. But look, you need to start sooner. I mean, look, we're, look folks, we're not building a space shuttle here. This isn't rocket surgery. You gotta start sooner and then you'll finish on time. I mean, we have all these cool things. We have alarms, phones. They'll tell you how to get up in the morning, how to preach, apparently. <laughs> you have all the tools available to you. If you don't want to fix the problem, you must not want to fix it. That's the more reasons that being late is so bad. Because it's just everything's in your hands. And here's the thing. Men, if you can't get your family to church on time, I blame you. You're like, oh, but my wife can't get ready. I blame you. I don't blame your wife. I don't care how long she does, your hair, or whatever. I blame you because you're not being good, a good leader. It's that simple. If you can't get your, church, your family to church on time, you're not being a good leader. It's not your wife's fault. Even in David's case, you know, maybe it wasn't the best decision for David to pick Amasa as his, as his second in command, as his captain. Next, and this will tell you the 30 minute math and why, if that didn't add up in your head, how that you got to add up. Realize that being on time is late. If you're on time, you're late. You should always be at least 15 minutes early. Haven't you ever heard that before? I mean, I show up an hour early. I'm an hour early to work every single day. I work nine hour days. Why? Because, because who cares? I want to do more than what I said I would do. That's the way you need to be. I want to do more, not less. So look, I mean, you say, where's this time? I'm supposed to be 15 minutes early now? I mean, this is getting bad. You say, where's the time? Well, that brings me to my third point, is become a morning person. Turn to Proverbs 6. Become a morning person. It's not an option. If you're an adult, it's not an option. Turn to Proverbs chapter 6. Look at verse number 9. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 9. The Bible says, How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. You say, I'm just not a morning person. Well, you're lazy, is what the Bible says. Look, the virtuous woman, she rose early. I mean, these people are waking up early. Look, no adult doing what they're supposed to do in their life should be sleeping past seven. I mean, how's that for a blanket statement? I get up at five and I consider that sleeping in at this point in my life. If you rise early, you should have plenty of things to get done and ready. And you say, well, why can't people rise early? I know what your problem is. You say, I can't rise early. You know why? Because you stay up too late. What are you doing staying up so late? I mean, you're probably staying up late reading your Bible. That's probably what most people are doing, right? You're staying up until midnight, 1 o'clock, reading your Bible. I mean, especially now with the challenge. I mean, so, I mean, people are going to be like, I'm late all the time because I read my Bible all the time. No, you're not. That's not it. I doubt it. Look, folks, being on time, this is a pretty simple message this evening. Being on time is easy, and it's such a simple problem to fix but if you're always late, you are literally choosing this. That's, that's the issue. If you're always late, you're literally choosing to be late. And it will make such a, I mean, it's such a simple thing. Who wants to, I mean, like, talk about low-hanging fruit in your life. You know what I mean? Talk about problems. I mean, look, some problems are hard to fix. Like, I mean, say you're like a heroin addict or something. I mean, I've heard that's really hard to kick. I've never been a heroin addict, but I've heard kids don't ever, I mean, look out here. But look, I mean, it, some things are hard to fix. But look, this is an easy thing to fix, and it will make a huge difference in your life. So, I mean, and here's another thing. It also, this, this idea, this also needs to be passed on to your kids. 
This needs to be a culture with your kids. Look, don't give your kids things to do without deadlines. Don't be like, hey, go clean your room, hopefully before you're 18. You know, don't be like, hey, can you go do your chores for the rest of the day? Or just leave it open-ended because they'll just, they'll be out and it's like, doo -doo -doo. you know, this is how you end up with kids that are adults that can't show up anywhere on time. They never had any deadlines. They never, my mom had an egg timer. You, ever, you know those old, old plastic egg timers? Do X. I mean, I looked at that thing like it was a bomb. And I'm like, ah, ah. You're doing your work and he goes, he goes ding. You're like, ah. I mean, I was afraid of the egg timer. Get an egg timer for your kids. Clean your room. What happens when that thing goes out? Oh, yeah. You'll have your room cleaned on time next time. Egg timers are like $4.99. I looked on Amazon this morning. But look, here's the thing. If it's a culture, make it a culture with your kids, and then your kids won't have this issue going into, I mean, so many things, I mean, you need to define with your kids. But you've got to pay attention to the details. You've got to pay attention to the details. If you're early to everything, if you're early to everything, work, church, appointments, I mean, look, it, it, it's, you're going to gain trust. You're going to gain responsibility. You're going to gain all of these things. And look, trust and responsibility, these are things that are, that are hard to build to, and they're really easy to lose. It, it takes time to build that type of trust. But it will make a large difference in your life. Luke 16, 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And the Bible says when you take the little things seriously, you're going to be given bigger things and more things. And, and, but look, I mean, Amasa, if he would have lived and Joab wouldn't have murdered him, you know, he, he wasn't getting any more responsibility. That's why it's part of this series. You know, you'll be someone that can be relied upon. You'll be someone that's trustworthy. You'll be someone that's given more responsibility. Someone who can be taken at their word. And somebody who, who needs, you know, every lead, look, every leader needs. You think, oh, you know, you just got everything squared away here. No. Every single leader needs people that they can rely on. I mean, look, you show me a group of people who are trustworthy, that keep their word, and are selfless, and I'll show you a bunch of people that show up on time. It works, both, it works the other way, too. And you, let me tell you something. You give me a group of people like that, and we'll make some things happen. When you have a group of people like that. And it's such an easy fix to just be on time. But it's a big deal. And, it, you know, people struggle with it here, which is why I bring it up and why it's part of, you know, our Good Habits series. Low-hanging fruit. Grab that fruit and improve your life. That's what this series is about. All right, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.